No. No buzz. A Just Bees book club uh, today. I have read, or well, about a week ago I have read, um, this this little book. Well, slightly different from the thumbnail because I have an advanced reader copy that came in, even though this is a this book came out in 2019. Um, titled A Short History of Spaghetti with Tomato Sauce by uh, Massimo Montanari, uh, translated by Gregory Conti. Um, I think the only difference is they probably fixed a handful of typos here and there, and uh, they included 23 spot illustrations uh, in the actual book that are not in my copy, so I didn't get to see that. Um, this was a nice, this is a, I, I really, I really enjoyed this book. Um, a fan of, of making pasta. I'm actually not a fan of tomato sauce. Um, like, I'm sure there are good, you know, ragus and bolognese and all that um, out in the world. I'm, I'm positive, in fact. Just not really my thing so much. Um, love a, love a olio e olio, love a cacio e pepe. Um, tomato sauce, just generally not my favorite thing in the world. Um, I think I had a lot of, a lot of not great tomato sauce growing up, honestly. Um, but yeah, this is a, uh, this is, it is what it says it is, right? Um, it's mostly a history of spaghetti, um, how, how it was not, in fact, uh, like, brought to Italy by Marco Polo from China, but was, in fact, more of a, um, more of a, a Middle East Arab world, um, transplant into Sicily when, um, you know, in the med medieval period, I believe. Um, this guy specifically, Massimo Montanari, seems to be a medieval historian also. Um, and uh, he works on a timescale that a lot of things that I read don't. Uh, just not, don't personally do a lot of digging into medieval history. Um, but yeah, where's the... Um, let, me, let me just uh, sort of pull out his sort of thesis bit. Uh, mm -mm. There are here <laughs> there are so many versions of this plate of spaghetti with tomato sauce that we have decided to analyze exclamation point. So let's choose a minimum common denominator, a standard that will satisfy, if not everybody, most people. The basic elements will be, obviously, spaghetti and tomato sauce. And the same goes for grated parmigiano. A less obvious choice, but equally important in the collective imagination. Redon and Lario have already demonstrated this to us, and historical analysis confirms it. It's an important, an important parenthetical there for, in terms of how this book is written. Uh, let's add olive oil, calling it simply that, leaving out the extra and the virgin, the extra and the virgin terms that only today have acquired a precise meaning in merchandising and marketing. Let's add garlic and/or onion. Choose one or the other, or both together. It's just a question of taste. We won't deny ourselves a basil leaf by now a commonplace of Italian identity. Salt. We could stop here, but a pinch of chili pepper is suggested in the majority of recipes. Um, so that's the sort of, that's the end of the, uh, it's not the intro, it's actually like the fourth chapter, <laughs> um, but it sort of sets the parameters of, of what histories um, Montanari is going to investigate. Um, and it, it it's he does it like i said mostly spaghetti um but uh like or the the bulk of the actual text is about spaghetti and and the transfer of pasta and how it developed into an industrial thing in sicily and 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 uh Napoli, napolitano uh oh my god why, why am i napoli nap uh, uh. Wow, what a good brain break moment to have while trying to talk into a microphone. Uh, I'll show that I don't edit. Um, yeah, so you get stuff like uh, the fact that like all long pasta used to be was referred to macaroni for like hundreds of years. Um, there's fun little tidbits like some of the earliest um, pasta recipes called for boiling the pasta for an hour, or even, or like on the shorter end, a half an hour, um, and how, and sort of later on it. it sort of addresses that uh, one of the reasons they probably started co cooking it al dente rather than what we would refer to as overcooking it now is because of 
um, street vendors and and more um, industrialized production of pasta that uh, led to or uh, helped lead to different shapes or uh, um, not shapes but um, uh, desires in in production and consumption of of pasta. Um, there's a lot about um, hot versus cold and dry versus wet as the sort of humors, uh, the sort of science of, of the Middle Ages, I believe, um, and how a lot of recipes from that time would um, be attempts to balance out those four elements. So you you if you have something hot, you add something cold. If you have something wet, you add something dry, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's sort of like that balance is how cheese and pasta became so interrelated. Um, he, he does make, I mean, there's a whole chapter about how spaghetti with tomato sauce is probably the reason that Sicily had forks before most people. Um, oh, I found that word. Yeah, Neapolitan. That's, wait, is there, uh, there's like one thing that I'm like flipping through this trying to specifically find, which is funny because like half of the reason I do this is to train myself to look into the camera when I'm like talking because I'm like terrible at making eye contact with people. And this is like sort of a facsimile of that, a sort of way to practice this this project as a whole. And now I'm just like uh, talking while, <laughs> while flipping through. I'm like, it's okay. It's, there's a, there's a good little bit in here somewhere where, um, nope. Uh, there's a long Latin quote that sort of boils down to um you know a sort of goofy insult or like you know something about how like pasta without cheese is like whatever without whatever is like you know the world without meaning or something like that it's not that at all but like some sort of grand jokey statement that uh <laughs> is latin for like pasta and cheese go together real well um which i found very funny uh, i find this book very funny i also found it very i, I mean I'm obviously not following up on the um, things that he's citing. Half of them are, I think, exclusively in Italian, for instance, uh, and I'm just not actually doing uh, this academic work myself. Um, just sort of reading it as a popular work. But the um, as as Cameron Kunzelman on Game Study Study Buddies would say, the sort of citational apparatus here is uh, is really robust in a way that I think a lot of popular histories um, sort of don't seem to be. Um, I, I'm not going to do an episode on it because I, I only read the first hundred pages and then before I gave it to the friend who I bought it for, but there's a, a book from Repeater Books that came out like last year called um, Deep Sniff and uh, the History uh, the history of Poppers and Queer Future or something like that. I'm, mix, I'm mixing up the subtitle, but it's a, it's a history of poppers that is again in that sort of popular history, um, queer theory-ish space, but that I ended up kind of like, I was going back and forth on even as I read the first hundred pages of just being like, this is like treading, this is this is doing that thing that a lot of popular histories do of being like, it's memoir, it's, um, it's rigorous research, and it just kind of like never quite cohered for me. Um, so that's my short no-no buzz on <laughs> Deep Sniff. Uh, in the middle of my internet buzz on a short history of spaghetti with tomato sauce by Mont Montanari, um, which I think I've covered pretty much everything I wanted to. The um, It feels genuinely thoroughly researched, but also fun and readable. Um, it opens with a discussion of um, <laughs> basically epistemology. Um, uh, or rather, yeah, the, the, the opening sentence is... The Idol of Origins. That's what Mark Bloch, Bloch, the greatest European history and historian of the 20th century, called it. Searching for the past for what paved the way to the present, according to Bloch, is an obsession typical of those who concern themselves with history. It also dominates the collective imagination. Nothing wrong with that on the face of it. It all depends on what you mean by origins. Simply the beginnings? In that case, the concept is fairly clear. Or does it also mean causes? In that case, what we're looking at is a historical determinism that is both naive and unsustainable, as well as contradicted by experience. Given a point of departure X, there is no single destination Y, but rather a multiplicity of possible directions, defined by circumstances, the interactions of various forces, chance, and the unforeseeable. And, and as soon as I read that, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig this, because 
there is a there is an argument about history being made, and that argument has to do with material circumstances, among other things. Um, and I was like, yeah, cool. Give me give me a materialist read about spaghetti and tomato sauce and basil and salt and maybe a pinch of chili pepper. Um, and it and it yeah. It, it stuck the landing. I'm, I'm very curious if I ever see a, a copy of it come in the store or whatever. I'm going to definitely, like, take a peek at the uh, at the drawings. I bet they're, I bet they're, they're fine. Uh, the cover is nice. It's a, it's a cute little cover for this kind of thing. And it's a Europa book, so I'm sure it's, you know, uh, it is, it has, you know, uh, care put behind it. Europa seems to have, seem to care about their books. Um, so did most people, but whatever. Um, yeah, that's... That's the thing. Um, I got in and out in 10 minutes. It's a, it's a new record. That's probably not true. Okay. Thanks for not watching.